Welcome to episode two of the History of Pandemics, brought to you by Pelican Tours. Thank you to all of you that watched the last episode, and I'm particularly grateful for any feedback too. Like last time, there's a lot of background in this episode. Hopefully that's relevant and interesting, or at least one of the two. Forgive me, but I think setting the scene is quite important in understanding this epidemic, and particularly its significance. So, as you know, in this week's episode, I'm going to talk about the Antonine Plague. This plague affected the entire Roman Empire, which, at the time, was about 60 million people, as well as the entire Mediterranean and the majority of Europe. Almost a quarter of the world's population lived within the confines of the empire in the second century after Christ. Is that enough to be a pandemic? Well, I don't really know. Pandemics are epidemics but on a grand scale, but they need not be worldwide. It's thought, though, that the Antonine Plague spread from Han China, along the Silk Road to the Near East, before being brought to Rome. So, the disease likely affected many more than just those inside the empire. So why Antonine? Well, Antonine refers to the imperial dynasty that was ruling Rome at the time of the outbreak of the plague. This dynasty, generally called the Nerva Antonine dynasty, ruled Rome from 96 until 192 AD. And in particular, the plague is associated with the emperor Marcus Aurelius, whose full name, in fact, was Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And he was ruling Rome together with co-emperor Lucius Varus during the Antonine Plague epidemic. The period generally of the Nerva Antonine dynasty is traditionally considered to be quite a stable and prosperous time. So Rome was actually doing pretty well when the plague actually struck. In fact, five of these emperors, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius, but not Lucius Varus or Commodus, are generally considered to be the five good emperors, which is a name first coined by Machiavelli in the 16th century, and it's since stuck pretty well. So to begin with, I'm gonna do a bit of an overview of the empire in the second century. Um, politically, we'll look at who was ruling uh, and the effect that this may have had, uh, we'll also look at the geography. What did Rome consist of at the outbreak of the plague? And also the climate. Uh, how was this and what effect may that, may that have had in terms of the uh, in terms of the spread of the plague? And we'll look at trade routes within the empire, because like the climate, this may well have contributed to the fast spread of the plague after its, uh, after its initial outbreak. So next, I'm going to look at the Parthian War of 161 to 166 AD. So yeah, great, we'll get some more war. I'm sorry for those who thought there was too much war in the last episode, there's gonna be some more war in this one because it was during this conflict that the Roman soldiers contracted the plague and then they brought it back to the empire. So we can't help but, uh, but look at some more war. Um, also, for those that are interested, what is the Parthian Empire? Where is it? What was it? Well, the Parthian Empire roughly corresponds to a bit of Afghanistan, a bit of Pakistan, some of the Arabian Peninsula as well, Iran and Iraq. And it was roughly the same type of geographical area as the Persian Empire that we spoke about in the previous episode. And to do a bit of a bit of a tangent, and do a bit of whistle-stop tour of what had been going on in that region since the last episode. So the Persian Empire that we spoke about was really the Archimedean Empire of Darius and Xerxes. And this, some of you probably know, was eventually destroyed by Alexander the Great. And he has, of course, uh, managed to control for quite a brief time in the fourth century, a huge landmass extending all the way from Macedonia to India. However, when Alexander died, his empire was sort of divided up amongst his generals. 
And the most famous of these was probably Ptolemy, who established the Ptolemaic Kingdom. Uh, that was in Egypt, uh, and that actually was, was brought to a close in the first century before Christ. The dynamic of Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, Octavian and stuff, that is the demise of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt. But another one of his generals called Seleucid captured the area that had been Persia and established the Seleucid Empire. However, if we fast forward a few years until about 200 or so years before Christ, the Seleucid Empire collapses. A, a group of Arsacids, they're called, or Arsacids from Parthia, which is an area just to the east of the Caspian Sea, they take over and they establish the Parthian Empire. So that's sort of a, how we got there. Um, we'll look at how exactly the Romans contracted the plague. Where did they get the plague? How did they get it? And there's a few interesting myths and legends, which we probably think are myths and legends, but are still interesting uh, because they tell us a bit about how the Romans saw the plague themselves uh, and we'll also talk about how it spread back to the rest of the empire as well. So then I'll look at the consequences of the plague for Rome. How did it affect her military for example? How did it affect Roman society? What were the political ramifications? What were the consequences for religion uh, as well? And we'll look at this in terms of the immediate effects like death toll, for example, which resulted in manpower shortages and all sorts of other consequences too, but then also possibly some of the longer term, more indirect effects of the plague as well. Finally then, we will turn to epidemiology. What was it? Was it smallpox perhaps? Was it measles or maybe something else? Do we think we know what it was? probably have a greater sense that we do, uh, certainly a greater sense than the plague of Athens, uh, but we'll speak about some of the potential issues with, uh, with knowing that as well. Let's begin with politics. At the turn of the second century, Emperor Trajan was presiding over a huge empire, the largest it had ever been. Rome controlled the Mediterranean, Europe's Atlantic coast, and most of Europe itself. In fact, in 106, Trajan conquered the Kingdom of Dacia, mostly in modern Transylvania, and in doing so, he extended the frontier north of the Danube for the very first time. Ten years later, he extended the empire past the Euphrates, defeating the Parthian Empire and conquering both Armenia and Mesopotamia, and stretching the borders of Rome to the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf. This did not last, however. Trajan died a year later, and his successor Hadrian believed that the extension was unsustainable. He moved the borders back west of the Euphrates and established client kingdoms in Armenia and in Upper Mesopotamia. Under Hadrian, Rome's borders remained secure and a period of peace began. The emperor himself broke with tradition in a couple of ways. Firstly, he grew a beard. Allegedly, this was to hide his scars, but his successors copied him. And in fact, if you see a statue of an emperor with a beard, you can tell that it's Hadrian or later. In other words, after 117 AD. No beard, almost certainly before. Another unusual thing that Hadrian did was to visit different provinces of the empire. And in fact, in 122, while on a visit to Britain, he ordered the construction of the famous wall that still bears his name. Having ruled for 19 years and almost 60 years old, concern was developing as to who might be Hadrian's successor. In 136 AD, he chose his friend and the current consul, Lucius Seonius Commodus. But unfortunately for him, he died two years later never becoming emperor. Consequently, Hadrian was forced to nominate another successor. This time he chose Antoninus, an able man who had served him well in the past. But he was only 10 years younger than Hadrian, 
And so, to shore up the succession in the longer term, Hadrian forced him to adopt both Lucius Sionius Commodus's seven-year-old son, who shared his name, and the 17-year-old Marcus Annius Verus. In time, these men would be known by their imperial names, Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius. Later that year, Hadrian died and was succeeded by Antoninus, who, for his religious piety, became known as Antoninus Pius. Turning now to the climate, it's an interesting observation that the growth in Rome's empire coincided with a particularly warm period of Europe's history. During this time as well, North Africa received a lot more rainfall and was actually a particularly agriculturally productive region. The trade in wheat from Egypt to Rome was vital in sustaining the city. Italy itself was believed to be a subtropical climate. Date palms were grown in Greece, and it might sound too good to be true, but they even grew wine in Britain. More seriously though, some historians believe that the raised temperature actually allowed the Antonine Plague to spread throughout the empire more easily. This map is quite confusing because there's a lot going on, but it does a decent job, I think, of showing the trade networks of the empire in the second century. You can see the empire's border in red, external trade routes into the empire in blue, and the internal routes in orange. It does a good job in showing how interconnected the various parts of the empire are, which of course would necessitate the regular movement of people around it. Trade on this scale in Europe was historically unprecedented, and after the empire's fall, it would not be matched again for centuries. It should become immediately apparent that this type of system, should disease break out anywhere, would quickly spread to the rest of the population. The transport of people and livestock, especially from outside the borders, represent particularly strong risk factors here. Of relevance, too, is the Roman army which comprised of about a quarter of a million men and was stationed predominantly at the borders, in particular, the northern frontier. They traveled regularly and mixed with troops across the empire and are another risk factor in the spreading of disease. In March 161, having ruled for almost 23 years and aged 74, Antoninus Pius lay slowly dying in Rome. Along with Hadrian's rule before him, Rome had enjoyed a long period of peace with no significant conflicts fought for over 40 years. On his deathbed, however, the emperor spoke of nothing but his anger at foreign kings for betraying him. When Antoninus Pius died, as Hadrian had envisaged, his two adoptive sons, Marcus and Lucius, succeeded him. Marcus took the name Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, known as just Marcus Aurelius, and Lucius became Lucius Varus. Both these men were young, just 39 and 30, to become emperors. They were also the first joint emperors, an experiment the Senate was especially concerned about. In fact, they wanted Marcus to take the role solo, but his loyalty to Hadrian's wishes prevented this. Marcus was older, had more political experience, and was known as an educated and knowledgeable scholar. In fact, later on, he would go on to contribute to Stoic philosophy with his writings, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. However, there were concerns about his health, as he was often sick. By contrast, his adoptive brother Lucius had less political experience and was known to spend his time gambling, drinking, partying and pursuing women. In other words, didn't really have the qualities you'd look for in an emperor. In fact, neither men 
had experience of the military, which was usually a prerequisite for an emperor. Both also lacked any great knowledge of the empire. And whilst Marcus Aurelius had been trained in some sense by Antoninus Pius, he was never trained outside of Italy and rarely outside of Rome. On top of that, there had been peace for two generations. All of that, however, was about to come to an abrupt end. In late summer, King Volagassus of Parthia, presumably one of those treacherous kings Antoninus Pius had been speaking about, began a war that would last six years and spread an epidemic throughout the empire. Rome had been at peace for a long time and its new emperors, as I've said, lacked military experience. It seems likely that both factors persuaded Volagassus that she may well have grown a little soft. A Parthian army raised in Ctesiphon, the empire's capital, moved north to the kingdom of Armenia. Armenia was officially an independent kingdom, but like Osseroni below it, was really a client state of Rome. Hadrian had moved the official borders of the empire back west of the Euphrates and created these two sort of quasi-imperial provinces that were officially independent kingdoms, but were really um, kind of under the dictation of Rome. Um, at this time, the king of Armenia was a guy called Sohamus, and he was a, a Roman friendly monarch, but the Parthian Empire moved in. They deposed Sohamus and installed Pacorus, who was a Parthian king and actually the son of Volagassus, the king of Parthia. Rome responded. The governor of Cappadocia, a region which is pretty much eastern Turkey today, raised a legion, invaded, but they were met on the road by a second Parthian force and completely obliterated. A second Roman army was raised in Antioch in the province of Syria. However, that too suffered a defeat, a few losses, and then chose to retreat. At this point, things were not looking particularly rosy for Rome. However, of course, she responded. Four legions were raised from the northern frontier, all seasoned troops, and they were quickly dispatched east. Of course, this weakened Rome's northern border and the governors along it were told to avoid conflict with the Germanic tribes at all costs. As well as the legions, Rome saw fit to send one of its emperors. Lucius Varus, the playboy emperor, was sent to oversee the operation. He was younger than Marcus Aurelius, he was healthier too, didn't suffer uh, any of uh, Aurelius's problems there, but it's also likely that the Senate was thinking that this charge would curtail some of his playboy character, and um, that the responsibilities that it entailed would finally make him realize the responsibilities of what it was to be an emperor. In this though, it's safe to say they were pretty disappointed. Lucius Varus enjoyed a king's procession from Rome. He stopped in Greece for quite a long time. He met a mistress in Smyrna that he took with him. He partied along the Anatolian coast and was accompanied by singers, musicians, gladiators, and actors as well. He eventually arrived in Antioch in Syria in 163 AD, it took about a year to get there. When he was there, uh, he shacked up in a palace with his mistress and continued to drink, gamble and party just as he had in Rome. He was frustrating to all of the Roman officials around him who wanted him to actually take charge of the campaign. Um, to be fair to Lucius, he did write regularly to Rome, but of course it was nothing to do with the campaign. He was actually asking about his favourite chariot team, the Greens. And believe it or not, he actually had a gold model of his favourite horse, Valachia, that he took everywhere he went. Uh, he was 32 years old at this point, uh, I should add. He did actually um, do some changes to the Syrian army while he was there. He banned gambling, at least for the soldiers, if not for himself. Uh, and he intensified training as well as brought in a, a generally more stricter regime. During this time as well, he actually shaved his beard 
Apparently, this was on the request of his mistress, but it was something that the Roman soldiers subsequently mocked him for nonetheless. Two of the Roman legions that had arrived from the west moved into Syria, while two remained in Cappadocia, and later in the year moved into Armenia, where they defeated the Parthians. In the meantime, however, another Parthian force moved into Edessa, the capital of Ossorone, another client kingdom of Rome. There, they deposed of the Roman friendly king Manus and replaced him with the Parthian, Wail. In Armenia, though, things were getting back under control. Pacorus had been dethroned and Sohemus was re-established as the country's king. The capital afterwards was moved several miles north away from Parthia to the Greek settlement known as Carnipolis or New City. From Syria, to get Osirone back under control, a legion moved into Edessa. It defeated the Parthians and forced them to retreat to the Tigris, where they then dispersed. Soon after, Manus was rightfully returned to the throne. Having re-established control over Osirone and Armenia then, Rome decided to inflict more damage on her enemy, best to kick her when she's down, and another legion departed from Syria, travelled down the Euphrates, intent on the capital, Ctesiphon. It is here, however, that the Romans moved into the danger zone, for recently, pestilence had arrived in the city. It is believed that the disease arose in China a year before, travelled along the Silk Road, through Central Asia and arrived in Mesopotamia, just in time for the Romans. And in fact, Chinese records also attest to a plague breaking out around the same time. At the end of 165, Roman forces left the Euphrates and began their march to the Tigris, intent on the twin cities on the northern and southern bank, Seleucia and the Parthian capital, Ctesiphon. They first reached Seleucia, a Greek city and capital of the old Seleucid Empire. The citizens inside welcomed the Romans in. However, in an act later condemned by many in Rome and many since, the Romans poured into the city, burnt buildings, raped, pillaged and murdered. They also stole the city's statue of Apollo. In some sources, it was during the sack of Seleucia, in some odd divine justice perhaps, the Romans first contracted the plague. From Seleucia, the legion marched across the Tigris and laid siege to Ctesiphon, eventually forcing their way inside, sacking the city and torching the royal palace. In other sources, it is here that the Romans first got the plague. What we know, it was this legion, the one that invaded Lower Mesopotamia, they were the first to record the plague, and it seems it was contracted somewhere during this operation, either in Seleucia or Ctesiphon or possibly both. Both cities were along the Silk Road and it seems likely that if the plague were present in one, it would be present in another. Although it is also probable that the plague had only recently arrived in Mesopotamia. For example, there is no record, for instance, of the Romans observing its effects in the Parthian troops they'd encountered in previous months. Interestingly, a couple of legends persist around how the Romans caught the plague. These are almost certainly nonsense from a scientific perspective, but they're useful in telling us how the Romans themselves viewed their contraction of the plague. The first involves our jolly emperor, Lucius Varus. Records don't show that he ever left Syria, but the myth is that he was present at Seleucia and opened an old tomb. This act of sacrilege caused the plague to break out and spread amongst the Romans as punishment. Another story tells of a soldier illicitly opening a sacred golden casket in the temple of Apollo in Babylon, which allowed the plague to escape. Now, sources don't suggest that the Romans ever went as far south as Babylon during this conflict. However, the idea that the Romans had been punished 
by the gods for their behaviour during the Parthian campaign is interesting and potentially points to the shame around their behaviour in Seleucia. The statue they stole, for example, was eventually installed in the Temple of Apollo on the Palatine. All Rome, therefore, would learn of this act of vandalism. So, having re-established their supremacy in Upper Mesopotamia, returned allies to the thrones of Armenia and Osirone, and sacked the twin cities of Seleucia and Ctesiphon, the Roman legion returned west, joining the others around Antioch. Of course, though, many of the soldiers were infected, and when they brought the plague back west, they infected the rest of the soldiers too. And when they returned west, back to the northern frontier, or to the other parts of the empire, they brought the plague with them. Rome was about to suffer its first epidemic. The legions returned to their posts along the northern frontier and quickly infected other soldiers, as well as getting into the Roman trade network. Soldiers regularly travelled across the empire, both to periods of rest and to begin a new post somewhere else. Additionally, they were regularly in contact with trade routes and so would undoubtedly have contaminated merchants and probably slaves too, travelling throughout the empire. This interconnected web allowed the disease to spread rapidly, and within a year, it was rife across the entire empire, from Hadrian's Wall to Alexandria. The plague would ravage the empire for 15 years. At its peak, it killed 2,000 a day in Rome. Around 5 million deaths are predicted in total across the empire, which had a population at the time of around 60 million, and that would have been diminished by around 1 in 12. Of those who actually suffered the disease, the mortality rate was thought to be around 25%. And one area which was particularly hardly hit was the military, recording a significantly higher death toll, and as a result, the frontier was significantly weakened. So the northern frontier was diminished. Rome was able to raise new legions to fill these gaps. However, this depleted manpower from other areas of society, such as agriculture and administration, and at a time when they were already affected by the plague. This led to economic devastation and failed harvests, raising the number of casualties still further, and really, it's impossible to calculate how many died from the plague indirectly in this way. Despite the new legions raised, German tribes smelt a new fragility in the Roman armour, and they coordinated an attack on the empire beginning in 166. For the first time since Julius Caesar, over 200 years before, they crossed the Rhine and pillaged Gaul. Further east, the Danube frontier was assaulted in 167 when the Macromani tribe led a confederation that crossed the Danube and assaulted the Roman province of Pannonia. For the first time in generations, the empire was under siege and its emperors needed to respond. Thankfully, the legions, together with locally raised militia in the west, were able to see off the invaders there. But those in the east, a confederation of 11 tribes proved harder to bulge. In the spring of 168 AD, both emperors, Lucius Varus and Marcus Aurelius, intent on securing Rome's frontier, set off for the Danube. This campaign would last the duration of their lives. In the following year, Lucius Varus caught the disease and died en route to Aquileia, where the emperors had intended to winter. The devastated Marcus Aurelius, in the time-honoured Roman tradition, escorted his co-emperor back to Rome, but in the spring of the following year, Marcus returned to the frontier, where he would spend the rest of his life. It should be noted that it was during this time 
that Marcus Aurelius wrote his famous Meditations, a major contribution to Stoic philosophy. This is also when and where the early parts of the film Gladiator is set. And whilst I absolutely love the film, there are quite a few historical inaccuracies. Marcus Aurelius, for instance, was in reality only in his 50s at this point, whereas I'm pretty sure Richard Harris was a lot older in the film. Also, Marcus never really intended to restore the Republic, which had been gone for almost 200 years by this point. And rather than work to exclude his son Commodus from power, he actually planned his succession. Returning to reality then, in 180, the plague claimed its second emperor. Just a few weeks shy of his 59th birthday, somewhere in modern Austria, Marcus Aurelius caught the disease and died. Upon his death, his son Commodus, who had already been ruling as co-emperor, at least in name, for three years by this point, now took the full reins of imperial authority. The selection of his son as his successor is probably the act that most undermines Marcus as a so-called good emperor. Commodus would prove himself to be a megalomaniac dictator and often ranks alongside Nero and Caligula as Rome's worst ever emperor. His rule would prove a calamity for the empire and bring to an end the relatively stable and internally peaceful period of the five good emperors. So, now that we've hopefully got an idea of the plague's short-term effects, in terms of death toll, economic devastation, and military strife, not to mention claiming the lives of two emperors, let's postulate at the potential longer-term consequences. I've divided this into five categories which to an extent do overlap. Effects on Rome's military, its northern frontier and relationship with the Germanic tribes across both the Rhine and the Danube, the identity of the Romans themselves and their belief in Rome, Rome's religion or religions, and trade across the empire, particularly in the east. Fairly obviously, Rome's military was weakened by the plague. And this meant that often local militia were used instead of proper legions to defend the empire. These soldiers would not have been full Roman citizens, and so it facilitated an increase of men whose loyalty to the empire was questionable, becoming responsible for its defence. Another way this happened was the hiring of foreign tribes as mercenaries. Again, the issue here was primarily one of loyalty and interest. This strategy would eventually prove disastrous for the empire and contribute to its demise in the 5th century. The ravages of the plague certainly increased this policy and it became staple in many border provinces. Whilst of course related to the military, I think Rome's northern frontier deserves specific attention, especially because of what happened in the decades and centuries following the Antonine Plague. This frontier would never again be secure as it had once been. From the Macromanic Wars of the 160s to the fall of Rome in 476, tribes would regularly threaten the empire from across the Rhine and the Danube rivers. Roman governors increasingly stretched for resources were forced to make compromises with aggressive tribes, allowing them to settle in the empire in return for protecting its borders, which in the long term only encouraged future tribes to attempt the same. Again, it's possible to trace these policies that would eventually contribute to the empire's collapse back to the shortages caused by the Antonine Plague. Interestingly, some historians have suggested that the Antonine Plague, as well as the subsequent Germanic invasions, served to undermine Rome's sense of invincibility. For centuries, they had ruled the roost. Their military was the greatest in Europe, but legionnaires 
fell from the disease just as any man. Perhaps Rome was no longer the blessed city that it had once been. Leaders were questioned, as was its religion, and in general, goodwill and loyalty to Rome, which might have been historically high, was severely compromised by the epidemic. In terms of religion, we've already seen the legends that circulated around how the plague emerged in Mesopotamia, and in particular, that there was a sense in which the gods were punishing the Romans for breaking sacred taboos. Some, however, blamed Christians for angering the gods. They refused to acknowledge Roman deities. Most egregiously for the state, they would not even recognise the emperor as divine. However, during the outbreak, Christians are said, in large numbers, to have offered care to the sick and the dying. Christianity at this time was particularly apocalyptic, obsessed with the idea that the world was about to end, and the plague seemed to justify it. And given that the afterlife was eternal, and life on earth temporal, why not spend your limited days caring for the sick? If you catch the plague, you'll just get to heaven sooner. Indeed, you may even increase your chances of getting there. Both the seemingly justified apocalyptic pronouncements of Christianity and the offer of salvation in the afterlife proved very attractive to the fearful Romans, and it's predicted that the faith doubled during this period. In the short term, trade suffered across the entire empire, but eventually it picked up. However, the routes east were more seriously affected. A Roman delegation had actually visited the Chinese court in 166 with the idea of opening up trade relations more significantly. Following the outbreak of the plague, however, this did not materialize. In fact, if we look at archeology span at this time, this also points to less commercial activity between East and West following the second century. Although it should be pointed out that trade did not cease entirely. Finally then, let's turn to epidemiology. What disease was the plague? Luckily, its symptoms were extensively recorded by Greek physician Gallen. Gallen was actually accompanying Emperor Lucius Varus when he died in 169. Gallen states that a black rash covered the victims' bodies. Sometimes the pustules of the rash would ulcerate. Where they didn't, they'd become rough and scabby. At other points, he notes that it was only in those who survived that developed the black rash. Interestingly, he connects the disease with the plague of Athens, which he calls the pestilence as described by Thucydides. He says that the rash itself seemed similar. Diarrhea, he says, was a common symptom, with many having bloody stools as well. Other symptoms he reported included fever, vomiting, bad breath, coughing, and internal ulcerations of the throat. The disease, he said, would last around two weeks, by which time the victim would have recovered or died. Medical historians have traditionally believed that the disease was either smallpox or measles. Recently, however, molecular research into the phylogenetics of measles has estimated that it diverged from the rinderpest virus, a disease that affects cattle, sometime in the 11th or 12th centuries, much too late to be the disease responsible for the Antonine Plague. However, it is predicted that smallpox is at least 16,000 years old. As such, smallpox is now considered to be the most likely cause of the outbreak. But there are a few issues. Generally, the mortality rate of smallpox is 30%, a little higher than that reported during the plague. Additionally, smallpox actually does not spread as quickly or as easily as many other viruses. We can possibly conclude that the death rate during the plague was simply underreported and that the close quarters of the Roman military provided the perfect environment for the disease to spread. Additionally, it is possible, as has happened in many diseases, 
that the virus has mutated and evolved since the second century and now behaves in a quite different way. Of interest too, is that smallpox seems to thrive in subtropical environments. The dry summers of temperate climes seem to reduce its efficacy, yet we know that the empire contains subtropical zones because of the Roman warm period. With regards to Rome, we can see that the disease had profound effects on her empire, permanently weakening its military strength and undermining its prestige and power internally. It encouraged desperate policies that would one day result in the empire's demise. Additionally, it empowered a new religion, which would one day come to dominate not just Rome, but all of Europe. On the disease, we can be pretty sure, at least most historians are, that this was the world's first recorded smallpox outbreak. The disease would go on to ravage humanity for almost two millennia, particularly devastating the Americas following the European arrival. We have Edward Jenner to thank for its cure. He developed the world's first vaccine in 1798. It spread to all corners of the globe took almost two centuries, but we have not had a case of the disease anywhere since 1978. And I urge you to look up the story of Jenner if you don't know it. It's really quite an interesting one. Thank you for watching. Next time, we shall return to the city of Rome to discuss the plague of Cyprian and the crisis of the third century.